Javad Zarif, the foreign minister of the Iranian government, he spoke at the Council of Foreign Relations in the U.S. a few months ago. Now, his speech is an excellent example of what aboutery, of deception and lies, of deflection. And of course, I don't know why he didn't have the longest it's nose possible like, uh, when he left the hall. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the reason is because we live in a in a world that this seems to be acceptable and entertained, and that's a tragedy, where you have an Islamic regime, a theocratic regime, that uses any sort of obscure argument to hide the realities of life mm. uh, in the country. When the question is specifically about certain conditions in country, he um, reverts to lies and deception, and I think that seems to be acceptable. Mm. Listen to what he says on elections in Iran. He should take up acting. Iranian, 73% of the Iranians went to the polls and voted for their president. I think that's what determines the views of the Iranian people. They were not forced to go to the polls. Nothing happened to the 27% who didn't go to the polls. So 73% chose to go to the polls and elect a president. They've done it with President Rouhani. They also did it with President Ahmadinejad. I hated it, but they did it. That was a response to the performance that we had under the previous administration. So people went and elected somebody else. And then when they didn't like President Ahmadinejad, they didn't elect somebody like him, they elected President Rouhani. But the point is, people can, in fact, turn out at the ballot box and vote, and through that show their frustration, their anger, their disapproval of a certain political view, and vote for another. Well, and usually, in, in, I mean, every midterm election in the United States shows that people are not happy with the vote that they had, so they elect the other party into office. People can be unhappy with, the, uh, with their choice. And they can vote for somebody else. Happens in Iran too. You do not run the only democracy in the world. Now, Zaharif has the goal to compare elections in Iran, elections in Iran, with elections in the West. Now, clearly, there's lots of problems with elections in the West. We know that they come every four years, give promises, and then do what's good for the rich and the powerful. It's their democracy basically it's not really about democratic rule and people's rule but i mean compare that with a theocracy where you have to be a muslim man the supreme spiritual leader and the guardian council have to determine who can run women can't run I and mean, we're talking about a farce not an election to compare it is absurd absolutely and bear in mind that anybody who opposes those elections or wants to demonstrate against those things immediately arrested and put away uh, he had the guts actually recently to, in an interview to say even the supreme leader is elected. I mean, come <laughs> on, guys. And he had. That, elected the, by two of them. Absolutely. The tragedy is not that he lies, uh, um, is that that's taken seriously mm. and accepted as a version of truth. It's in the, the reality, it doesn't matter anymore. It's just the, you know, it, it's okay for the foreign minister of a country to to constantly lie and undermine the reality. And, and he says basically that, you know, people are free to take part in the elections. Well, that's not really true either because Khamenei issues fatwa saying that it's haram or religiously not prescribed for people not to vote. It's haram if they put a blank vote as a sign of opposition. And also, of course, every time you vote, you get a stamp in your identity card, which you need for work and for other subsidies. So it's actually, there's lots of pressure involved. It's not an easy choice or a free choice for a large number of people. This is a complete farce. In the same line of argument, you can go ahead and justify uh, the uh, uh, dictatorship in Romania during Ceausescu's time. You could argue that uh, Mugabe's Zimbabwe, people were expressing the view, that's how he worked. Or you could argue, actually, you could justify any, any type of dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And the tragedy, as I said, is that this line of argument is entertained and people are offered platform to come and talk about these rubbish.
when you have demonstrations here, it's called freedom. When we have demonstrations in Iran, it's called regime change. What is it? I mean, a lot of people turned out in the streets of New York. They called themselves 99%, whatever, the Wall Street. And there was some violence. And there was some police brutality. People turned out in the streets of France. There was police brutality. Nobody called it uh, beginning of the end of the French regime, tweeting that the French regime is over. Hold up. So, I mean, I, I know President Trump went to Saudi Arabia and said, wow, nobody demonstrated against me. They can't. <laughs> And is it bad that we can demonstrate? Is it that bad? No. That, that you all of a sudden, all of, all of everybody in the United States just gets too excited and starts tweeting that now we see the end of the regime. Political, <laughs> you cannot, you cannot, you cannot determine when you have a political process. The political process itself determines the outcome. The, exactly the same happens in Iran. People express their views. People, sometimes there are excesses, but what happens is that the government understands through these expressions mm -hmm. that there are areas that government's behavior, government's conduct, government's performance <coughs> fall short of the expectations of the people. And we understood that. We understood mm -hmm. that the people of Iran expected more. You see, our economic indicators are very good. Now, the other absurdity when you hear what Zarif says is he's comparing demonstrations in Paris with demonstrations in Iran. Now, listen, Mr. Zarif, you know very well that when we go and demonstrate in London or in Paris, we have a right to association and demonstration. They're, they, the police have no choice but to allow us to demonstrate because this is the rights that have been fought for by people in these countries. Now, in Iran, demonstrations are illegal the right to association is banned. Different political views are banned. Therefore, when people protest, it's not because you've allowed them or how, because of how great you are. It's because people are protesting despite your rules and despite your bans. That is interesting. He laughs at the Saudi uh, prince who, uh, uh, and the fact that Trump has gone there so there's no demonstration. Mm -hmm. He says, oh, look, but people don't have the right to demonstrate. It's exactly the, si the same situation in, under the Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. Of Iran. In Iran, people do not have the right to demonstration and freedom of expression, and people do that, as you say, mm -hmm. despite the Islamic regime and the force. Them. The difference between Iran and Saudi Arabia is that people have, uh, did not allow you, uh, they do not allow you, Mr. Zarif, to turn Iran into a Saudi Arabia. Yeah, and the other thing is, he talks about how. Uh, just because there are demonstrations, it doesn't mean that there's a demand for regime change. Well, not all demonstrations are the same, are they, Mr. Zarif? So if Palestinians are demonstrating, they don't really care about the occupation. They've just got some things that they're upset about. But, you know, it's like any other demonstration in Paris. Or when people are protesting against, you know, the South African apartheid regime. Was that just, you know, they were just unhappy with certain aspects of the apartheid regime. No, there's, there's differences between demonstrations and totalitarian states, as the Iranian regime is, versus uh, protests in countries that are more democratic only because of people's pressures in those countries. It's amazing how Zarif is allowed to get away with, uh, with, this, with these statements and lies. He compares the demonstration and protests and the suppression of the protesters in Iran with Paris and, and New York and says, well, the degree of, uh, you know, excess, excess. excess is different. You know, where demonstrators are uh, arrested, uh, the, uh, they are tortured, and mm. some of them are executed and killed on the street. And actually, when they arrest them and they, they, they uh, employ or uh, uh, they have a lawyer to go and visit them and defend them, the lawyers are arrested as well and executed in, on some occasions. How could this be compared to a mm. uh, demonstration of the 99% mm. in New York mm. who, who stay there for, for weeks and weeks and weeks? Yeah, I mean, the, th the thing is, too, that, look, there is police brutality. There's no question. There is huge amounts of discrimination and bigotry in countries in the West as well. And there are are attempts to stop protests and, and quash protests, but you can't compare 
uh, you know, uh, protests and the response to it in more democratic societies versus one that are in really oppressive totalitarian ones. It's like comparing apples and oranges. And it's this thing we see always with the Islamists. What about this? What about that? What about this? No, well, can we ever speak about yes. what you're doing, please, with that? hearing about Saudi Arabia. You're no different really from Saudi Arabia, except that people in Iran aren't tolerating it. Every country has a dress code. If the lady was sitting here, I would tell her that every society has a dress code. We may like that dress code, or we may dislike that dress code. But the laws of that society require people to respect the dress code that they establish. In some societies, you, I mean, if somebody goes out naked in the streets of Canada, they'll be charged with, well, well, there's a name for it, in, in, huh? Indecent exposure. Indecent exposure. It's now, not quite a see, dress no, code, hold on. but I take the point. Huh? It's not quite a dress code. We really call that an undress code. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. You see, <clears throat> that's culture. In a, new t in, in a society that believes in nudity, that's, a, that's a, a restrictive dress code. So you set, the, you set the limit somewhere. And that somewhere is determined by the moral norms of that society. In Iran, for a man to go to the street without a t-shirt on, that's indecent exposure. Hmm. They have to put something on. I, I know uh, uh, that you cannot even enter McDonald's without a t-shirt on. That's a, that, that's a dress code. I do not want to minimize that. But, but you should not over uh, sensationalize it. Fact is, uh, there is a dress code. Women in Iran participate in the so social life, participate in the political life, participate in the educational life. We have more women students in Iran than men students. And we have better women students. Uh, each time I teach, the best grades in my classes, women get. So, I mean, that, that's the reality. But my problem is, in your closest allies, women don't have the right to vote. Even men don't have the right to vote. And I don't hear people making such big cases about them. This guy is just allowing women to go to cinema, and he's praised as a transformational figure. Now, this is the funniest. Zarif says that it's our culture, it's our traditions. This is why we don't like, uh, you know, uh, people with uh, different sexual orientations or we don't like women not to be veiled. Well, the reality is that's the Islamic regime's culture. That's your backward, misogynist culture, Mr. Zarif. It's not the culture of the women who are removing their compulsory veils and protesting it. And so, you know, in a sense, they represent the real Iran, a modern Iran, an Iran that wants secularism, that wants the separation of religion from state. And you represent the, the things that are pulling people backward in that country. Yeah, and if it was the uh, culture of Iran, you didn't need uh, so much uh, police on the streets and enforcing a job uh, day in, day out. So it's not the culture of Iranian society and Iranian people. It's Islamist culture being imposed by force. Mm -hmm. And that's why people have the right mm -hmm. to remove the veil. And, and they are the ones who actually represent the true uh, essence of the Iranian society. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, Zarif refers to uh, um, forcible and compulsory hijab as a dress code. Hmm. I a didn't realize code. we have a dress code here in London, we all wear the exact same thing. Uh, you know, Mrs. Zarif, please, this is a joke, and that people actually listen to you uh, is a bigger joke, because the fact is that there are no uniforms in the West. There are people who wear the hijab as well. There are those who don't wear the hijab. Some people show their belly button, others wear mini skirts, others wear long dresses. It's a choice, it's an individual choice. And this is something that you really can't get into that little head of yours, is there? And so, you know, calling it a uniform, a dress code, is really a way of obscuring the reality that it's an imposition, and it's an imposition that has been imposed very often by brute force, by your morality police, by putting uh, pins in, in women's heads, by throwing acid in women who aren't properly veiled, and, and, and so on. I'm them all the time. It's interesting that the uh, um, uh, Mr. Zarif 
uh, um, refers to the culture of us as nudity. <laughs> And he said, "Look, uh, your culture is something else, and our culture is, you know, uh, you know, hijab and and um, and the uniform of Islamist uniform. No, it isn't. Mm. And also, also he refers, you know, he gives example of people not being allowed to go into uh, uh, McDonald's with without a T-shirt. How could how could he be allowed? Comparing apples the whole and oranges. Society been covered in dark shrouds." With uh, you know, with uh, people having uh, um, um, uh, you know, people not being allowed to go into a store with, without uh, uh, um, uh, without the top, you know, they, this is the deception and yeah. lies of the Islamists that they always do around these issues, it's, and they think is a spectrum. Yeah. This is where you draw the line. We draw the line over here. That, that's what it is. But again, this is so much like people who compare FGM, for example, with. Tattoos. I'm sorry, they're two different things. And again, it's it's trying to bring a sort of cultural relativism that justifies the oppression of women in the guise of culture and religion. And of course, women in Iran are responding very clearly to Mr. Zarif and to the Iranian regime on the streets every day. There, I mean, Iran is a very... People have specific traditional cultural values. We do not, again punish or criminalize anybody for their activity at home. What is important is what they do in the street, what they do in the society. And we have a different set of norms than, than Western societies when it comes to sexual preferences. Exhibited in the street, not in their personal lives. Islamist deception has no limits. You know, he, he says that uh, we don't interfere in people's private lives. And they can do anything they want uh, within the boundaries of their own private domain. That's not the case. The reality is that how many times they've, they've actually raided people's home mm. because they've had private parties. Mm -hmm. How many times, you know, young people have been dragged into Evan prison mm. because they published the video that they've been dancing on uh, in their own home. Or, you know, there's so many examples. And even gay you, sex. Uh, uh, I mean, really, yeah. are people having sex on the streets? Is that why you're arresting them and executing them? I mean, ridiculous, isn't it? It's just a cop-out again. Yes, absolutely. So there's no, uh, as far as Arif is concerned, there's no qualitatively different uh, uh, difference between Islamic regime and any other society. It depends on where you draw the line. Mm. Well, we beg to differ. To afford, if you want to afford such exceptional treatment to religious minorities, you cannot provide it to anybody who claims that I'm a religion. That's the issue. Mm -hmm. We do not recognize, we only recognize three religions as official religions because when we recognize them as official religions, we need to afford them these privileges under our constitutions to be exempt from what the Muslims have to do. Being a Baha'i is not a crime. We do not recognize somebody as a Baha'i as a religion, but that's a belief. Somebody can be uh, agnostic. Somebody can be an atheist. We don't go take them to prison because they are an atheist. So uh, this is the difference that you need to make. But being also, being a Baha'i does not immunize somebody from being prosecuted for offenses that uh, people may uh, commit. Now this is ridiculous. In Iran there are three recognized minorities, so we can't recognize anybody else because we don't want to give them exceptional treatment. First of all, Mr. Zarif, the three minorities that you talk about that have official standing, they're not treated very well either. But apart from that, it's just absurd to say that you cannot give rights to people except for certain groups, the, the whole idea and concept of citizenship, of individual rights, of people having rights irrespective of their background and belief is something the regime will never understand. And that's why you can make these bogus arguments and have idiots listen to you as if you're actually making any sense, yeah, and, which and, you're not. And, and removing the rights from individual and turn it into groups, only the recognized group that the Islamists Certain accept. Groups, yeah. And that's the, uh, th that's what Zarif is doing. Mm -hmm. In his argument, he's completely ignoring individual uh, uh, personal life and individual rights. Um, and he, he transferred that right to groups that he, only he recognizes. Mm -hmm.
and supposedly he recognizes yeah. how many individuals uh, Baha'i, Baha'is uh, were executed in Iran and dragged out of the home. How many young, ba- young Baha'is were excluded from university? Mm-hmm. How many oppon- opponents and young people and socialists and atheists been excluded and kicked out of universities because of your Islamic and standards? And executed. I mean, they had five-minute trials where they asked people, "Are you an atheist? Do you not believe? Do you believe in God?" If they said no, they were taken out and summarily shot. This is during the 80s. It's called the bloody decade in Iran. Hundreds of thousands of people have been executed, and he has the gall to say that it's not a crime to be an atheist. It's not a crime to be a Baha'i. I mean, honestly, and people are sitting there and applauding him and laughing at his stupid jokes. It just, you know, it's uh, astonishing. I I don't know what else to say. There are 130 crimes punishable by death in Iran, including for atheism, including for apostasy, blasphemy, for heresy. So, you know, to say that it's not a crime and to imply that anyone who has been killed and tortured and imprisoned has actually done something criminal. Absolutely, and and, and label everybody... Uh, criminal. That's the essence of. Yeah. That's the qualitative difference between Islamic regime and um, uh, and a civilized society. You know, can I just say something? Sorry, is that when you see the uh, response to Khashoggi's disappearance in the Saudi embassy in Turkey, suddenly people are shocked. You know, we don't want to work with the Saudi regime anymore. You know, we have to. Uh, stop our, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I just read uh, Virgin's Branson is saying he's pulling out of some sort of billion dollar deal he had with them. Well, hello, Saudi Arabia has been doing this every day, but because they do it in the country itself and and people don't have access to the media in this way, you know, it's, it's business as usual. And this is exactly what the Iranian regime does. The Iranian regime is no different from the Saudi regime. Uh, people in Iran are fighting back. And that's really the tragedy, isn't it? You've got someone who is really should be taken straight to prison for the crimes that he's committed against the Iranian people. Here he is sitting, speaking in perfect English with that ridiculous smile of his. People laughing at his jokes. It is really tragic, really tragic. It is tragic, Mariam. It is tragic. He always compares... Uh, himself, uh, his uh, standard is Saudi Arabia, and the uh, and the uh, and the prince, uh, you know, of Saudi Arabia. Mm. Well, Iranian people do not compare themselves with this with Islamist Saudi yeah. Arabian government. Iranian people do, uh, compare themselves with the most modern and the most civilized. That's why you are in trouble, Mrs. Arif. <laughs> you going backwards. You want you to drag society. Trouble. You drag want to drag the society mm. to you know fourteen hundred years back. Iranian people want to go beyond the 21st century and mm. beyond, and that's the standard. And that's the difference, with, qualitative difference between you mm. and the people of Iran you tell that you do not represent. Well, we are in Syria for the same reason that we went to the aid of the uh, Iraqis and we went to the aid of the Kurds. You see, there is an official narrative here in the United States, and that narrative is being repeated by everybody. And in order for that narrative to be comfortable, they forget some parts. Iran has a consistent record of fighting extremism. We are in Syria to fight extremism. We are in Iraq to fight extremism. Okay, seriously, I mean, my head is exploding every time I hear this man speak. To say that they're in Syria, to go to the aid of the Kurds and the Iraqis is just unbelievable. I mean, the Iranian regime is one of the main perpetrators of crimes against the Kurdish people in Iran and elsewhere. And it's, you know, and and also, I mean, there are people in Iraq burning Khamenei's photo. They want Iran out of Iraq and its intervention there. So to call it an aiding the people there is really the rewriting of history and reality. Fact, the man has no shame. No the shame. Has it's no, sort of like no Trump. Shame. It's this era, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the relationship between the Islamic regime and Hezbollah and the uh, Syrian government even way beyond uh, Daesh mm-hmm. and ISIS. Mm-hmm. You know, they have that relationship they, with, with Russia. They've been supporting the Syrian government. 
to suppress the Sir Syrian people and Daesh became an excuse and opposing fact between the ding dong between the Islamic regime and the Saudi Arabian you know trying to intervene in in that region the Islamic regime is the source of extremism ha, in yeah Iran. that's the funniest that they're it, there to fight extremism absolutely they are the source of extremism I guess in Daesh Iran. was there to fight extremism in Syria can well. I finish my Sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> seriously Islamic regime is a source of extremism in Iran exactly in Iraq in Kurdistan in uh, in Lebanon in Syria and they try to consolidate in you know they try to push away the the, uh, the competitors which is Saudi Arabia in sort of establishing a slightly different version of extremism uh, they both are you know they are the ones actually trying to cultivate this uh, extremism and use it as a means mm -hmm. to terrorize Iranian people and people of Middle East and use it as a bargaining chip with the with United States Europe to have a, a slightly bigger uh, a piece of the pie yeah I mean to say that they're extremists doesn't mean that there aren't other extremists around of course there are and very often it's the extremists fighting each other uh, but nonetheless I mean I think uh, the use of this what about them and what about this we see this all the time you know uh, and and I think that's why it's created a climate along with cultural relativism and the fact that as you said earlier truth has become irrelevant now that Mr. Zarif can actually sit there and say these things while there are so many people in Iran languishing in prison facing torture so many of our loved ones who have been killed and who are no longer with us because of the crimes of this regime the regime that he represents and he has the nerve to come and speak in English and talk all of this nonsense and to lie, just blatantly lie. It's only in this uh, times that truth is a casualty mm -hmm. of the, the powerful in America, mm -hmm. uh, in Middle East or various versions. In Europe you see the rise of the sort of people who deny the reality uh, and truth of the life of people. But on, oppo on the opposite side there are people of Iran and the huge, huge masses everywhere in America, in Europe, everywhere who are fighting for the basis of a society which is based on recognition of reality and truth.